I think in order to properly introduce this sonata by Prokofiev, I have to tell you a little bit about the person who inspired the piece, and that was Mstislav Rostropovich. I was privileged to first hear this legendary cellist perform in 1965 when I was 13. That's not a joke. <laughs> He uh, was on his first concert tour of America at that time, and he came to Washington, D.C., where my family lived, and he performed with the National Symphony, the United States premiere of another piece by Prokofiev called the Symphonia Concertante, which was his cello concerto. And this took place 50 years ago, and yet I have the most indelible memories of my response to it because it just seemed like God had come down from on high to sit on the stage of Constitution Hall and play the cello for us. And at that same time, up in New Jersey, there was a young cellist named David Finkel, who was similarly falling under the spell of this legendary Russian master. And being a cellist, he was able to persuade his parents to let him range up and down the East Coast, following Rostropovich wherever he went. And so he became a fixture at his concerts and backstage afterwards until finally Rostopovich became intrigued and invited this young fellow to play the cello for him. And as a result, David became Rostopovich's first American student and his protege, and he remained very close and they recorded together toward the end of Rostopovich's life. Now, to go back again 15 or 16 years to 1949, Rostropovich was then about 22 years old, and he performed a recital at the Moscow Conservatory. And in the audience was Sergei Prokofiev. And Prokofiev was so blown away by the way that this young man played the cello that it just, it was a life-changing event for him as well. And I think he felt that it was life-affirming at a time when his life needed a lot of affirmation because as you may know, he left Russia in 1918, the year after the revolution, when things began to deteriorate. He came to America, and then he came to Europe. And he didn't go back full time to live in Russia until 1936, moved back at the height of the Stalinist terrors. And it may seem like a rather peculiar time to go back. He certainly knew that composers like Dmitry Shostakovich were being castigated as enemies of the people. And uh, that was the year that Shostakovich wrote, I guess Stalin didn't like his opera, Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk, and he was, his music was banned. And so he knew about this. But I think he expected that he would be treated differently, that he would rise above these kinds of humiliations because of his great international renown. And he was wrong about that. Not long after he came back, he became just another pawn in Stalin's chess game. He was allowed to go back to concertize for a little while in the middle 30s, but his family were not allowed to join him. They became effectively hostages, make sure he came back. And within a short while, that became a moot point because in 1938, they confiscated his passport, never gave it back to him. So in the rest of his life, until he died in 1953, he was a kind of a prisoner. And things got worse. In 1939, he wrote his first Soviet opera called Semyon Katko. And the man who directed it was a gentleman named Meyerhold. And he and his wife were arrested on one charge or another, and they were both killed by the NKVD. And so it gives you a sense of how things were deteriorating for him. After the war, Stalin decided to start clamping down on artists and writers and composers, just as he had during the 30s. And so he appointed as his cultural minister a thug, a, uh, a human attack dog, whose name was Andrei Zhdanov. And in 1948, he organized a meeting of the Soviet Congress of Composers, and he stood Prokofiev and Shostakovich and Aram Kachaturian and others up and humiliated them publicly, made them apologize for the sins of formalism, of writing music that was contrary to the precepts of socialist realism. And although it was on one level nonsense, and another level it was not nonsense for those who were the butt of this 
humiliation because Prokofiev and Shostakovich lost their ability to make a living. Their music was banned. And Prokofiev's wife, Lena, from whom he was separated, was arrested on trumped up charges of espionage and sentenced to the gulag. So that's the context for this visit to the Moscow Conservatory in 1949, where he first heard Rostropovich play. And it was such an amazing concert that he went back and introduced himself, and they became friends. And Shostakovich, I mean, Prokofiev, he was protected in a way by Rostropovich. He became his, uh, although he was only 22 years old, he became an advocate for him. And the musical fruits of this relationship were that piece I heard played in 1965 and this wonderful cello sonata that we're about to hear, which was premiered, of course, by Rostopovich and also by Sviatoslav Richter. And to give you a sense of the ordeal that left, led up to the first performance, Richter wrote, before playing it in concert, we had to perform it at the Composers' Union, where these gentlemen decided the fate of all new works. During this period, more than any other, they needed to work out whether Prokofiev had produced a new masterpiece or conversely, a piece that was hostile to the spirit of the people. Three months later, we had to play it again at the plenary session of the composers who sat on the radio committee, and it wasn't until the following year that we were able to premiere it on March the 1st, 1950, in the small hall of the conservatory at Moscow. So that's the backstory. If you hear it in that context as triumph of the human spirit, and particularly Prokofiev's spirit over adversity and repression, I think you were not wrong about that. And as if to drive home that fact, he wrote on the first page of the score, the words by Maxim Gorky, mankind, that has a proud sound. So enough said. We are very fortunate because we get to hear Rostropovich's first American protege, David Finkel, play it for us now. <laughs> 